Hi, Andrew Penn back again to talk about medications for bipolar disorder. We're going to start off with the classic mood stabilizers. So we're going to go over all the mood stabilizing medications, but I want to really focus in on lithium as a primary tool for managing bipolar disorder and also talk about some alternatives to lithium. We'll talk about how to choose a mood stabilizer, understand the risks and benefits of lithium, and also take a look in this module at valproate and carbamazepine. In future modules, we'll look at uh, atypical antipsychotics and lamotrigine. Now, in general, when we're talking about stabilizing, um, when we're talking about bipolar disorder, if the patient is stable, we want to think about using the most tolerable medications first. If the person is unstable, then we're going to use the most effective medications first, regardless of tolerability. Now, probably a good example of this would be haloperidol. So haloperidol is a very effective antipsychotic, first-generation antipsychotic, but a very difficult medication to be on long-term. But because it's uh, reliable and effective, we often use it in the emergency room. But it's uncommon to see somebody on long-term haloperidol treatment. And the medications that we use should be evidence-based mood stabilizers. A lot of times when a new anticonvulsant comes on the market, there's a lot of speculation if, if it could be a, a mood stabilizing medication. This is because some of our common mood stabilizers such as lamotrigine and valproate are also anticonvulsant medications, but not all anticonvulsant medications turn out to be mood stabilizers. And this was certainly the case with gabapentin and with topiramate, for example. A lot of times we have to use more than one medication. Uh, it's very common to see polypharmacy in bipolar disorder, but it also means that we should get rid of things that aren't working. So if we're pretty certain that something isn't working, let's de-prescribe it. And you also want to make sure you're taking care of comorbidities, uh, such as insomnia, uh, such as anxiety, because those are things that are going to make it more difficult to stabilize your patient. And we also want to make sure we're always paying attention to side effects because that is one of the largest reasons why people stop taking medications. And the way you can think of this sort of spectrum is from uh, on the left side, from your sort of less convinced, if you're, if you're feeling like this person is, is likely fairly low on the bipolar spectrum, maybe just has unipolar depression, then your treatment was likely going to be an antidepressant. And that's fine. Uh, I'm less concerned about that for somebody who you are, are fairly certain has unipolar depression. If we start getting into more of that gray area where it appears that there is a cyclical mood pattern, maybe a bipolar 2, uh, you want to uh, generally avoid at least the tricyclics and the SNRIs because they are more likely to lead to mood destabilization. And you're going to want to think more about using a mood stabilizer as opposed to an antidepressant in this situation. So this is sort of the gray area. And of course, if, somebody, if you're confident that somebody has a bipolar disorder, then these are going to be your go-tos. Lithium should be at the top of your list, valproate, lamotrigine, and a number of the second generation antipsychotics. And you can see there that most of them are indicated for bipolar mania. Very few are actually have an, have an FDA indication for bipolar depression. And we'll talk more about that when we get into the subtopic of bipolar depression. Uh, again, this is a visual here of, of where, unfortunately, most of the medications that we have in the marketplace for bipolar disorder treat mania or prevent mania. Uh, there's very few that actually treat depression or prevent depression. And I want to make a point here that the term mood stabilizer is more of a clinical jargon that we use in psychiatry. It is actually not an FDA class of medications. So they will give a drug an indication for, say, acute or, or uh, mixed mania, or the prevention or prophylaxis of mania. They don't uh, call a drug a mood stabilizer. So it's important to understand that not all mood stabilizers are equal, and that most are usually better at treating the manic end of of the condition and not so great at treating the depressive end of things. I also made a note here, the prices are, are a little on the older side, but I believe most of these are still uh, relatively correct because uh, all these medications that are on the higher cost are still the ones that are, are uh, branded. And typically when a drug uh, is on patent or branded only, it's quite expensive. You can see something like the newest kit on the block, which is Cariprazine, runs about $13,000 per year per patient. So when you're thinking about what to prescribe, you, know, you obviously want to do what's best for your patient first. 
but you also want to be keeping in mind healthcare economics. And you know, there's only so many dollars to be spent, even if that money is coming from an insurance company or from the government like Medicare, uh, there's still only so many dollars to go around. And we want to think about spending those in the most cost effective and most importantly effective uh, for our patients way. So here's kind of a rough outline of how to treat mania. Now the good news is treating mania is actually the easier side of this problem. Uh, you, you do wanna make sure the person is safe and often that requires hospitalization, but typically people res will respond to a proven mood stabilizer. And a lot of hospitals will use two of these at once. So it's not uncommon to see somebody started on an atypical antipsychotic like olanzapine along with valproic acid, for example, that's what VPA stands for there. Uh, sometimes people will start lithium which I am in favor of because it does have evidence for helping with acute mania as well as preventing mania. And then you're going to titrate accordingly. So you're going to titrate up your dose. Uh, you're going to shoot for a full response, obviously. Uh, very commonly, you're going to need to uh, use a couple of different mood stabilizers at, um, and you may have to adjust the dose of each from the initial therapy. Uh, and then beyond that, it gets a little murkier. So if you had no benefit at all from the drugs you were using, you would change them. Uh, obviously throwing more medication that isn't working at a problem is unlikely to make it better. You're gonna wanna change strategies at that point and try a different medication. Uh, and then as we get further and further down the path, uh, the, there really aren't great protocols for that, but some people might use something like three different drugs or even ECT. Uh, in a very refractory case of mania. The good thing is usually mania will respond uh, before you get to that point. And typically a couple of mood stabilizers will do the trick. So these are the mood stabilizers with the best evidence. So lithium, valproic acid, carbamazepine, lamotrigine, and some atypical antipsychotics. Uh, there's, there may be some benefit from oxcarbazepine, which is trileptol, again, not well studied. Uh, Kepra. Uh, interestingly, there was some papers published about the anti-manic effects of tamoxifen, which is curious. Uh, and there's clear evidence that gabapentin and topiramate, which were popular candidates maybe about 10 or 15 years ago when I was training, do not have mood stabilizing properties and should not be used in that capacity. So I want to focus on lithium because lithium still, even despite its age, uh, is, it's been around with us for over 60 years now, is really one of the most effective medications for bipolar disorder. And it also, as I talked about in the treatment of resistant depression lecture, can be used as an adjunct to antidepressants. Now, one of the things that lithium is often forgotten that it is, it is as effective as antipsychotics in treating acute mania. So it's all the way on the far right there. And you can see it's roughly equivalent. Um, perhaps risperidone and maybe olanzapine have slightly more efficacy against acute mania, but it really should not be uh, forgotten about as a possible uh, drug to be used in treating acute mania. And most importantly, lithium has an anti-suicidal effect in a way that the other uh, anti-manic drugs like valproate do not have. And so this is a really important, when you think back to that bipolar disorder is a condition which can, especially if untreated, uh, be life-threatening uh, as a result of suicide. So thinking about lithium for your patients who experience suicidal ideation is a good idea. Now, how do you start lithium? Pretty straightforward. Uh, lithium is started at 300 milligrams, usually twice or three times a day. And you're gonna dose this on a therapeutic level. So it has a, a fairly narrow therapeutic window of typically most labs will list it as 0.4 or 0.5 to 1.2 uh, on the, so that's a trough level, which means it needs to be drawn right before you take your next dose. And so if somebody's doing this BID, you can either do it first thing in the morning before they take their morning meds, or you can do it at the end of the day before they take their evening dose. And for bipolar one folks, you usually wanna have a slightly higher blood level. I usually shoot for a level of around 0 0.7, 0 0.8, because that generally provides better prophylaxis against mania. For people who have bipolar two, you can often get away with a lower dose. And you wanna treat the patient, not the level. So the level helps us benchmark what was useful for the patient, what, was, what they responded to. But if somebody is doing great at 0 0.4, 
I'm generally not going to push it any higher than that if I don't have to because we uh, reduce the side effects with lower blood serum levels. You can always go up if you need to. Now, you don't want it to be too low because then you're probably not fully protecting your patient, but there's no need to push this aggressively if you're getting a response at a lower dose. And usual doses are about 600 to 1800 milligrams per day. Now, um, usually at first when you're dosing this, you're gonna wanna do twice a day because it's usually more tolerable to the patient. But once you find out the dose, you can typically move it all to bedtime. And there's some data to indicate that that's actually easier on the kidneys to uh, have just one hit to the kidneys per day rather than two smaller hits. Now lithium understandably has a lot of side effects. Uh, not, that, not that they can't be managed, but it's, it's important to understand what they are and to help your patients manage them. So it's not uncommon for this to cause uh, acne and sometimes hair loss, occasionally a rash. Uh, many people will get, um, I always tell people with, that if I'm starting lithium, you're gonna get more thirsty and you're gonna pee a lot. And so you're gonna wanna carry water with you. And the reason why is the uh, lithium leaving the body takes a fair amount of water out with it. And over time, this can lead to something called diabetes insipidus. Diabetes insipidus is different than uh, diabetes nephritis because diabetes insipidus is the inability of your kidney to concentrate urine. If you recall how your kidney works, uh, it takes about 100, it filters about 100 liters per day and it puts back about 99% of that and only excretes about one liter per day in the form of urine. So that's called concentration. If the kidneys lose the ability to do that, you're going to lose more water in the form of urine. And that is known as diabetes insipidus, which can happen to the kidneys after long exposures to lithium. Neurologically, you can certainly see sedation. You can see tremor, usually a fine tremor uh, that shows up a lot of times. People will complain about it when they're using their phone. They'll notice that their thumb is, is shaking a little bit. Or when they go to put the key in the door, they'll notice some shakiness. Or when they're writing. Uh, in larger doses, you can see ataxia. You can see people having um, some, um, some problems walking, but that's typically a sign of, tox of toxicity. It's not uncommon for lithium to cause uh, nausea and diarrhea. And I'll talk more about why we want to monitor the thyroid and weight as we go forward. Now, this term lithium toxicity is a little confusing because it sounds as if it's sort of categorical. Like if you go past a certain number on the labs, you are in lithium toxicity. And you can have lithium toxicity even at fairly low levels that might be within normal limits for a lab if the patient is showing a, a mass exaggeration of these symptoms. So if somebody comes to you, typically lithium toxicity, the person will actually look as if they're intoxicated on alcohol. They'll have sort of dysarthria, they may have ataxia and be stumbling, they'll, be, they'll have poor coordination. Um, and if you ever see that, you wanna get a lithium level right away because what might be happening is something has occurred that either they've lost a considerable amount of total body fluid, uh, they've taken more than they're supposed to, or they're having a drug-drug interaction that's causing the lithium levels to go up. Now, the long-term risk, risks of lithium include a decreased renal function and that diabetes insipidus that I talked about, hypothyroidism and weight gain, and also hyperparathyroidism, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, so the good news is that in general, lithium, long-term lithium use does not uh, lead somebody to end up on uh, dialysis. That's fairly uncommon. But what will happen over time is that you will see this uh, decrease in the GFR and increase in the creatinine levels, urine, or sorry, serum creatinine levels. And you're going to want to monitor those over time. Um, that should be part of each of the labs that you get is keeping an eye on the renal function. Uh, but the good news is that uh, most people who are on long-term lithium, while they can advance um, to a stage three uh, chronic kidney disease, typically they don't end up um, on uh, dialysis. So you often do have to stop the lithium uh, at some point in time, usually after something uh, around 20, 25 years typically. And if you start getting into these lower uh, GFR numbers, you're going to want to get a, a nephrology consult. This is a patient of mine who I uh, met um, around 2007. And at that point, he had been on lithium for um, for some years, so about 20 years, 21 years, and you can kind of see this trend line of what happened with his creatinine over time. So uh, when I got up to about 1.5, I suggested that we switch over to Valpro 8. And you can see that some of his kidney function actually rebounded once we got him off the lithium. 
Unfortunately, it didn't work quite as well as the lithium. And I had a number of patients in my practice for whom this was true. They really wish they could go back onto lithium uh, after having some renal issues. Uh, so thyroid and parathyroid is something else you're gonna to wanna to keep an eye on. So hypothyroidism is very common. It's more, much more likely than renal problems. Uh, and it often happens sooner. And you're gonna to wanna to keep an eye on that TSH because you may eventually need to give the person synthroid or thyroid replacement. And you also wanna keep an eye on the calcium level because parathyroid can also be disrupted by lithium. And so this is a newer recommendation, but I, I suggest getting a serum calcium level as well as your uh, TSH and your creatinine function. So there's your breakdown, there's your quick and easy uh, reference. So that lithium level, because it takes five days for the lithium to come to steady state, you don't wanna do your level before that. Now some people, if you're in a hospital setting, you might get a baseline creatinine, CBC and TSH before you start the lithium. But I'm usually fine with just putting those in the first set of labs that the person will do at the one week mark, at least five days. And they're gonna to wanna to do that as a trough level. So instruct them to go first thing in the morning or at the end of the day, right before their next dose. And then you, it's really important to monitor this every six to 12 months. This is standard of practice. And I've consulted on malpractice cases of lithium toxicity where the NP involved did not get a lithium level for over 18 months. And the patient presented with lithium toxicity and the patient had a lithium level of over three, I think it was like 3.2 and was in uh, acute lithium toxicity and sustained some neurological damage as a result. So don't let these folks that are on lithium slip off your radar. You want to create reminders for yourself uh, so that you make sure they get their labs. And each time you're refilling the med, you should check and see when their last set of uh, lithium labs was. We're getting that CBC because sometimes you can see leukocytosis from this. And the urine-specific gravity, it's not essential, but it helps, to, uh, helps you to notice if the person is having trouble concentrating their urine. And if it's a female patient, I'll also get a pregnancy test at that point. You, the other time you're going to get a lithium level is that anytime you make an adjustment to the dose, or if the patient calls you up and says, you know, I don't know what happened, but I've been feeling more depressed for the last couple of weeks. Before I do anything, I'll send them to the lab and ask them to get a lithium level uh, before I make any changes. Because sometimes for whatever reason, the lithium level has gone down. Now weight gain is a real uh, concern with lithium. Uh, it, it's not as bad as some meds, but it certainly is not benign. And it may be that people are um, eating more, but I often suspect it's because they're more thirsty. And so I always counsel my patients to make sure that they don't quench their thirst with caloric uh, beverages. Don't drink soda, don't drink juice. And it may also be uh, the result of the attendant hypothyroidism that can come with lithium treatment. Lithium also has some drug-drug interactions. The most common ones here are bolded. And so um, when you combine lithium with a diuretic or an ACE inhibitor or an NSAID, it's, uh, it often inhibits the clearance of lithium and you can get into lithium toxicity uh, with the combination of those medications. So you need to counsel, counsel patients uh, to use uh, acetaminophen instead of NSAIDs and also um, to be aware if they're prescribed, a, especially a thiazide diuretic or an ACE inhibitor. As mentioned before, you always want to make sure patients know that they need to stay hydrated, especially if it is hot out, uh, because if they're sweating more, they're exercising, they're going to be losing more of their total bodily fluids. Also, if they get sick, if they get like a, a gastroenteritis and they get a, a GI distress and they're losing a lot of fluid through vomiting or diarrhea, you want to make sure that they're not getting lithium toxic because the amount of lithium in their body relative to their total bodily fluid uh, has gone up. But this is not a medication without side effects. However, I really strongly believe that every patient early in their bipolar history should get a trial of lithium because we just don't know who's gonna be a really robust responder to lithium until we try it. And I have to tell you, it's shocking how many people go many, many years in the course of their bipolar illness before anybody tries lithium on them. And I think it's a real shame. So an alternative medication to lithium would be valproate. 
Uh, this is Depakote, also known as Divalproix or Depakine. Uh, this is uh, this is generally considered to be more useful for rapid cycling in mixed states. It has some anxiolytic properties, so people that have a lot of anxiety in their their bipolar condition, particularly their bipolar mania, might benefit from this. It generally is considered to be better of, of an antimanic than an antidepressant. So sometimes that's referred to as stabilizing from above rather than stabilizing from below, which would be more of an antidepressant response. And it's often used in hospitals because it's thought to be uh, more effective against people who are agitated or aggressive. To start valproic acid, you start at 250 milligrams, usually three times a day. Sometimes I'll start 500 milligrams at bedtime of the extended release. And again, you're looking for a therapeutic level here, this time between 50 and 100, 125. You're doing that again, five to seven days after you initiate the med because it takes that long to get to steady state and you're going to adjust accordingly. Typically doses to get in that level are between 500 and 2000 milligrams a day in divided doses. Again, treat the patient, not the level. Now, rather than testing the, the renal function and the thyroid function with uh, valproate, you're gonna keep an eye on the liver and you're also gonna keep an eye on platelets and you're gonna keep an eye on, for, on the pancreas, although pancreatitis is less common with valproic acid. The most common side effects are sedation, some GI distress, which happens in probably about 10 to 20% of people, uh, and then tremor and weight gain, of course. Now, this is a medication you wanna be really careful with women of childbearing age. I generally try and avoid it because uh, a good portion of pregnancies uh, upwards of 50% are unplanned. And this is a medication that is associated with teratogenicity, uh, particularly neural tube defects. And that's not something you, you don't really wanna have a patient on um, valproic acid who calls you up and says they're eight weeks pregnant because that time neural tube has formed and uh, there's a potential for some serious birth defects here. So I'm very careful with this in women of childbearing age. We have a real clear conversation about using reliable contraception. Here's the labs you're gonna get. Again, five days after as the minimum amount of time, usually a week is fine too. And you're looking for that level, I'm getting a CBC to look at platelets, and I'm also looking at LFTs, AST and ALT. You're gonna do that again at six weeks, and then you should be doing it every six to 12 months. And similarly, if there's a shift in mood or you've changed the med, you're gonna to wanna to do that five to seven days after you have made that change or before the patient comes to see you to talk about their, uh, their shift in mood. If they're having significant abdominal pain, you wanna check them out for pancreatitis by getting amylase and lipase. And if the person becomes very confused, you would wanna get a serum ammonia as well as uh, the LFTs to make sure that they're not in uh, liver failure. Carbamazepine would be probably your second or third line agent here. Uh, particularly against mania. This is a trickier drug to use because it has a lot of drug-drug interactions. And oddly enough, it can induce the enzyme which it clears itself. So you actually can, it can end up dropping its own level through auto induction of 3A4. I usually start this drug at 100 milligrams twice a day, also dosed on a level. And typical doses on this are between six and 1600 milligrams per day in divided doses. This is a drug that has a lot of challenging interactions and the ones that are, are most significant here are highlighted in blue and that's oral contraceptives. So because of 3A4 induction, uh, you can see less lessened effect of oral contraceptives, which you of course don't want that because of the risk for pregnancy. But interestingly, carbamazepine also drops its own level sometimes through that auto induction. Uh, so this is something you're going to want to keep an eye on if there are new drugs coming into play. If the person is on any of these drugs, you're going to want to keep that in mind as you are um, adjusting your levels. The most common side effects of carbamazepine are, again, the similar ones of sedation, uh, sometimes weight gain, but also hyponatremia is a concern here. So particularly in older people, if their sodium drops gradually, uh, most of us are probably sitting here with a sodium between 135 and 145. If you were to drop me to 120, all of a sudden I would be profoundly confused and I'd have a lot of neurologic symptoms. If you were to go very gradually over the next six months and bring me down to 120, 121, I might seem a little off, but I wouldn't have that marked shift. So in an older person, this can actually kind of create a pseudo dementia 
uh, presentation. And Stephen Johnson syndrome can happen with carbamazepine. I'll focus on that when I get to lamotrigine in the next module. So carbamazepine labs are listed here. Again, easy to remember, five to seven days uh, it takes to get to steady state. You get that level. Um, you're going to get a chem 7 to look for sodium. You're going to look at um, the potential for lowered white cell count. And you're also going to keep an eye on those LFTs. And again, you're doing this every 6 to 12 months as part of standard monitoring. So as I've said, if I haven't gotten across yet, my last chance here, that really start with lithium if you can. Everyone really should get a trial on that. Some people won't tolerate it. It won't help some people. That's okay. At least you know that. Um, having the evidence of, of, of medication not working is useful information. And for some people, it will work beautifully, and you won't find that out until you try it. So you have to make sure you get those levels for all these medications, but particularly lithium uh, for safe uh, patient treatment. And as backups, you have valproate and carbamazepine. Thanks for your attention.